আতার ভাই এখন বলা শুরু করতে পারবেন এর মডারেটর ইকো লিস্টার ডিট টক জাস্ট আফটার 10 সেকেন্ড and today's speaker is dr azizul haq he is very much well known in this forum dr azizul haq is a brilliant student of bangladesh and he is now working as consultant cardiologist emory university school of medicine i like to request dr professor abdul wahid choudhury to introduce our today's speaker dr azizul haq choudhury uh <laughs> today i'll be speaking from my car i haven't reached my home yet uh today's speaker ajit bhai our dear ajit bhai he has been a regular guest and participator and contributor in our programs and uh, one thing about ajit bhai is that uh, he has the depth just needed to assess the problem and he will always go in depth and in the theoretical background and everything i hope his lecture today on dynamic theory of abnormalities will enjoy the his lecture and will find out how much in depth analysis he can do with the simple theory ladies and gentlemen let us enjoy the show aziz bhai you can proceed assalamu alaikum everybody uh one thing that i'd like to know is this uh, uh, are the participants all from bangladesh or do you have any foreign students or participants today because otherwise i can uh, mix with bengali so that it will be better to understand from a lot of our trainee physicians anyway i'll try uh, uh you know in uh, definitely i can i'm uh, going to say i think uh, most of our uh, uh, attendees are from bangladesh okay then i'll mix that so that it will be easy to understand okay assalamu alaikum everybody aske ekta ami je topics ta ni alochona korbo seta amader main focus jeta asker discussion amader trainee physician okay jara md korchen cardiology the training nichchen tader ke focus kori kora ebong er physicians jara emergency room e kaj koren tader ke focus kori kora karon hocche ki je certain things that we know obviously when there is st elevation uh they are then definitely it goes to different category and jokhon there's subtle change in the ecg we are not sure but the patient has symptoms or not symptoms what to do with this situation because sometimes it's very important to diagnose that recognize that can ugulo miss korle kintu ei dhone patient there they might have significant cardiac event and potential death so that's the focus of my talk uh, so let's let's Uh, proceed uh, first jeta case ta amra dekhbo je 45 years old female with a history of hypertension presented to the emergency room with left sided chest pain 7 over 10 in intensity with radiation to the left arm and the patient she had some nausea diaphoresis that lasted about 15 to 20 minutes that that's the that's the reason she came here but it happened about 30 minutes ago so when patient reported to er uh she was pain free basically okay and uh, but she definitely had pain about 30 minutes ago that lasted about 15 to 15 to 20 minutes and patient reports this pain has been she has been experiencing that with emotional stress uh sometimes with activity and his her medications lisinopril amlodipine and the ecg i like to show you below so uh i would like to get participation from our audience uh, you know trainee physicians uh, anybody would like to comment on that please participate because nothing to worry about we'll discuss definitely in depth
uh, please participate. Okay, anybody just, yes, uh, Dr. Naim Hassan. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Mm -hmm. Sir, in this twelve lead surface ECG with mm -hmm. proper standardization and proper lead placement, and there is heart rate is seventy five beats per minute. The rhythm is normal sinus rhythm. Axis is normal, and there is there a T inversion in. V1, V2, V3, uh, V4, and V5 also. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there is no loss of R wave height in that leads. Okay, it's a nice presentation uh, and a, a description. Let's go to the, before you go to the conclusion, I'd like to the audience to participate with the following questions. You saw the ECG, you saw the presentation, the patient had chest pain, about 30 minutes before she came to the hospital. And during the examination, she was pain-free, but this is the presenting ECG. Let's go to the next things. Can uh, a audience participate in the question? I'm not question will answer, Kuri. I'd like to see the distribution of that. Should we start her on aspirin, heparin drip, beta blocker, high dose statin, and treat conservatively since she's pain-free? Uh, should we get an echocardiogram to assess LV function? Or should we send her to emergent heart catheterization? Or should we schedule her for pharmacologic myocardial stress testing for assessment of ischemia since she's pain free and if there's no significant rise in troponin, uh, there's, you know, whether we should consider that on the next morning. Or whether suspecting something else, so there's any pulmonary embolism, sometimes they can present some two wave abnormality or they were scheduled for CTA for suspected pulmonary embolism. Please uh, answer those questions. I'd like to see the distribution. So, poll, please. Mm -hmm. Come roll, poll, please. This is a practical question to you. You are seeing the patient in the emergency room and what you want to do with this presentation and ECG. Kamrul, poll started. Hello, Kamrul. All right, can you post the results? Hello. If, if not available, then you can go forward. Okay, okay, we'll see, okay. Yeah, please vote, okay. Uh, uh, we have only four. Just vote on the four. I think it should be okay. The choices in between. <laughs> okay. Please vote. Mm -hmm. Try number two together. All right, uh, so we have a different distribution, uh, interesting enough, okay? So let's discuss that because I'd like to see the distribution that tells us among our audience how much, you know, they have good understanding of the problem because that's the thing we need to focus on defining, explaining so that they can learn more on these situations. So the, uh, the ECG that we saw uh, let's go back on that. 
Uh, can you remove that? Okay. Uh, you know, we see that uh, tear inversion there, okay? The question right now, any patient comes with this type of tear wave abnormality, and they have uh, some uh, concern about chest pain syndrome, you cannot ignore those. You cannot ignore those. Okay, the question uh, right now, there's a terminology we call like biphasic T-wave or, or, or inverted T-waves with the, with the current uh, constellation of symptoms, uh, it's, uh, then you need to think about Wellens syndrome. Okay, there's a syndrome called Wellens syndrome because this are the situation that uh, sometimes patient really, uh, if you don't address the situation because they have some occlusion there and uh, they can have different arteries, but most commonly we see in the LAD uh, and uh, they can, we call it stuttering angina because they're reperfusing themselves, opening themselves, reperfusing themselves and opening, and opening themselves. And it can come to the point that, that it can occlude totally, then we'll see hyperacute T waves and we can see ST elevation. And these type of patients can go to acute ST elevation MI and definitely the subsequent cardiac event and potential death if we miss the situation. So here, uh, you know, as, as we point out here, it's called Wellens syndrome and I'm going to go into depth of that. So as we see on that, uh, in Wellens syndrome is kind of emergent situation. You cannot wait, uh, uh, you cannot treat the patient conservatively since it's pain-free. So 30% of audience that answered A is, is not accurate. In that sense, this is kind of emergent situation, dynamic TUF changes. They need to go to the cath lab. You don't waste time. You can do an echo, but it's not emergently. You need to do that right now. You need to send her to the cath lab. But definitely when these type of patients have dynamic TUF changes, you, you do not want to put them in pharmacologic stress testing. What's going to happen? They, they can precipitate acute MI because they have very little reserve and they can uh, cause, uh, cause uh, you know, total obstruction uh, with the stress test and, and you can precipitate event in the lab. That will be more problematic. So the patient needs to go to the cath lab and the patient went to the cath lab and definitely they, they had a proximal LED lesion. Uh, it was actually tight uh, lesion and patient underwent stenting, okay? So uh, this syndrome was described initially, Dr. Whalen's group in 1982 in American Heart Journal. And they, they, they presented a few cases because they saw this type of phenomena like biphasic t wave changes. Okay, they could type A and type B. I'm going to describe that later on. Uh, because if you're biphasic, like some positive and the negative t wave, uh, then it's called biphasic type A. Type B that we saw in our case, deep tube inversion that is type B. And they very nicely presented that, that uh, most of them, most of them initially they, they presented the cases, 100% of them had LED lesion, but subsequent, you know, more data coming out from different labs and different literature, it shows that uh, not 100%, maybe 50% has acute critical lesion. And not only that, that this lesion can happen not only in the LED, it can happen in the SARC and also it can happen in the RCA territory. So, uh, and, and, and it's very important that it, it is a, this lesion is highly unstable and there's high chance of reocclusion. Though sometimes they can have stuttering angina, they come and go. When you have that history, they come and go, you need to go in and try to go immediately to the cath lab. So what, how we manage those patients, definitely very quick recognition and, and quick intervention, as I mentioned, and most commonly they require a, a PCI with stenting, okay? And as I mentioned to you that a lot of patients uh, answered that probably you could do a stress test. The stress testing is contraindicated in the Wellen syndrome because it can exacerbate, once again, I'm repeating that, the limited reserve blood supply they have to the myocardium and precipitate myocardial infarction. So this type of ECG and they have clinical symptoms that chest pain comes and go, you should not put them to a stress test, those type of patients. 
So what are the criteria for Wellen syndrome? One, there's type B, type A that we talked about biphasic, initial part is positive and the negative biphasic T wave. Type B is T wave inversion. Totally, it's a deep and symmetrical T wave inversion. And 75% and of the time is in the LED territory and, and okay, in mainly in V2, V3 most commonly, but it can happen also V1, V4, V5, and V6. But they have other criteria also because the ST, they don't have ST elevation much. They have isoelectric or minimally elevated. Sometimes it should be less than one millimeter. And uh, there's no Q waves because they haven't infarcted yet, but they're going to happen. It's, it's going to ha happen, but they have to have angina, like on and off angina. It could be stress-related, emotional stress, or exertional, uh, just a history of angina. And, uh, but when they present to the ER, or to, to you, the most, uh, and we see those EKG, they are normally in pain-free state. That's a very important point. Because if they have pain going on in the ECG, that, that will fall into category of acute coronary syndrome, okay, unstable angina, or, 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 or non ST elevation MI if they, if they rule in for, uh, by troponin. But, but the pattern of the Wellen syndrome that the present, presenting state is pain-free state. That's one of the differentiation of the criteria. But they can have some either normal enzymes or slightly elevated cardiac enzymes, but, uh, but definitely uh, you need to look at those uh, criteria to call it Wellen syndrome. But management, take it quickly to the cath lab and most likely they will need intervention. Let's do a second case, okay? So, Dr. 50, Hall, yes. Is there any question for the case? Yeah. Uh, Are you want to yeah. ask? But before that, I have a question. Said, yeah. mm -hmm. Is there any explanation where the patient is pain-free? Do you have any explanation? Yes. What's happening, uh, you know, th there's a lesion there and there's a plaque there. Plaque, uh, you know, probably rupture, but there's some clot formed initially. Clot might have resolved because naturally we have our fibrinolytic system in our body. Okay. There's natural fibrinolytic system. Sometimes they resolve. Okay. And, 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 and the result they get pain-free because their flow is restored, but they can have again a clot formation. Okay, that's that's the time they present is pain-free. That means their blood flow is still going. That's not totally occluded. That that's one of the understanding of that because natural fibrinolytic system is still working. Okay, but but it will fail ultimately. All right, because the reason is what in one situation I can tell you that we have some patients that coming with this chest pain some ECG and you give some nitro, they open up, okay? Nitroglycerin, they become pain-free and they see the EKG might normalize, okay? So because of restoration of blood flow in the nitroglycerin, because they're not totally occluded, okay? That's the understanding of that, okay? Any other questions you have from any the audience? Question? Abdul Al Jamil, any question from the... Yeah. No, please go ahead. And you can comment also, please, uh, panelists, because I'm not interventional cardiologist. Uh, I just see those patients uh, and you have more experience probably, but you can comment on that, okay? Let's uh, look at the second case. Uh, this is a 56 years old male with a history of smoking, presented to emergency room with intermittent substernal chest pain for last two weeks. The difference between the previous case, this patient has continued pain while in the ED, okay? Blood pressure is there, stable, vital signs stable, unremarkable physical exam, and the ECG shows All right, anybody can comment on that ECG from the audience? Anyone can raise hand from the audience? Naim Hassan, you can. He's one of our brilliant <laughs> doctor here. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, I think it's sir. not much. Yeah, you can comment on that quickly. Sir, here yeah, uh, normal sinus rhythm, heart rate is 75 be uh, beats per minute, and there is mm -hmm. T inversion in V1 and V2. Otherwise, it looks normal. V1, mm -hmm. V2, and V3 also, sir. Yes, so definitely the starting point, there is some biphasic T-wave changes, okay? That's, that's the focus of this uh, in a ECG. 
And uh, if you look at that, uh, just uh, let's look at the questions, then we'll go, uh, do the question and answer. So should you start aspirin, loading dose, TK griller, heparin drip, beta blocker, high dose statin, and, uh, since, uh, and, and plan for heart cath in AM? Or just get an echocardiogram, AM means next morning. Uh, echocardiogram to assess LV function, or uh, schedule pharmacologic stress testing, or send for emergent left heart cath, or CTA for suspected pulmonary embolism. Similar type EKG presentation a little bit different. All right, we most of the. Uh, yeah, most of them correct, but a lot of people still chose A and B, okay? Uh, we just asked you what's the next appropriate action, okay? All right, uh, let's discuss that. Uh, let's go from here, okay? Uh, let's look at the, uh, uh, you know, uh, slide here, and also let's go for discussion. This patient presents with acute coronary syndrome, Okay, and though the ECG look like dynamic T wave inversion type, we call it like a uh, biphasic T wave, uh, that is one of the possible like uh, Wellens like syndrome. Okay, Wellens like EKG, not the syndrome, Wellens like EKG. Uh, so, but there's a biphasic T wave there, but the clinical presentation is a little bit different. But the patient is still having chest pain while in the emergency room. When you see in the emergency room with biphasic tube changes and acute uh, coronary uh, syndrome and continuing chest pain, definitely you need to think about heart cath, uh, you know, uh, more like invasive intervention, okay? The question right now, uh, whether you need to take the patient directly to the cath lab right now, that you call immediate invasive approach, like shortly within two hours as soon as possible, or whether you need to do like early invasive therapy, that means you can take him to the next day because our interventional cardiologist at home doesn't want to come to the hospital in the middle of the night. So we'll just cool him down with some aspirin, heparin, statin, beta blocker, and then we'll do it in the morning. Uh, or we could do ischemia guided strategy, okay? Or that uh, low, low TMA score and grace score low that we can do the ischemia guided strategy. Or in some certain patients that we do, that we have to think about before going to heart cath, we call delayed invasive strategy, okay? If some patient has like kidney dysfunction, you know, uh, low EF, you know, PCI, prior, prior cabbage, but their score uh, is not on the high side in the mid-level score, they will need intervention, but you have to think about what's the risk and benefits to do uh, you know, invasive strategy to these patients. So this is the risk stratification you need, you need to keep in mind, okay? So you know that the previous patient needs heart catheterization first. Question right now, whether he needs to go in now, we call immediate invasive strategy. Yes, because the patient has having refractory angina. You probably already treated, giving probably aspirin, beta blocker, heparin and uh, uh, you know, nitro, patients already there still having chest pain. And also if the patient has any symptoms of heart failure or any new onset like a heart murmur, like particularly the mitral regurgitation, okay? And if there's any hemodynamic instability on the patient, if you see that blood pressure drop, or whether there's any concern about cardiogenic shock coming along or something like that, okay? And uh, you know, recurrent angina that the patient has been experiencing then in our patient. And definitely if there's any arrhythmia going on on this patient, like if, if there's any, uh, you see VT or, uh, or BP, definitely the patient needs to go immediately to the cath lab. So the patient, so these are the things you need to keep in mind, like immediate invasive strategy, early invasive strategy that is within 24 hours, and delayed invasive strategy within 25 to 72 hours or ischemia guided strategy that low risk, you need to do a stress test then do risk stratify. Because this is very important for the, our training physicians, uh, you know, this for the board. And also you need to know exactly when, when to call the interventional cardiologist to come in right now to do that, okay? Let's look at the, uh, you know, coronary angiogram patient went to, we see very tight lesion and, and the LED, proximal LED, and definitely the patient got stented, okay? 
but the question hasn't stopped here. Let's go further, okay? So he underwent stenting uh, in the LED as we saw above, and he definitely received all the treatment that we do, uh, aspirin, ticagrelor, metropolol, statin. And, uh, and the echocardiogram shows mild hypokinesis in the anterolateral wall with EF of about 45 to 50%, okay? He remained stable overnight, no problem. But in the morning, when he was eating breakfast, he started having chest pain again, all right? So he says that it's radiated to the throat, lasting about three to four minutes, called the nurse, nurse did an ECG. This is the ECG, okay? And I'm going to show his prior ECG, just one. On. This is his prior ECG, ECG first ECG, biphasic TUF uh, uh, changes, okay? And, and the next day, just one second. Next day after the stress test, sorry, after the heart catheterization and stenting, when he was having breakfast, and at that time he's having this, having chest pain, nurse did the ECG. Okay, so anybody can comment what's the difference there in the ECG? So we definitely see, anybody can comment? The, our participants, please. Not, nothing unusual, but there are some change. You can you can just comment on them. We can go forward. All right. There's some. Uh, we see that there are some changes in the T wave abnormality. Initially, it was biphasic. Now we see fairly more deeper T wave inversion. Okay. Doctor Hawk. Yes. The, is there any difference of this issue with the, your uh, case number one? That is ECG of the case number one. No, no. Uh, that's that's. I'm 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 just presenting similar ECGs in different presentation. Right, right. Similar looking. Yes, and that's the focus of the talk today. Okay. Uh, let's let's. You looked at the ECG. Okay. Now let's. Uh, what you want to do with this ECG? Okay. So it's having chest pain again in the morning when he was eating breakfast. Nurse, he called the nurse. Nurse did the ECG and they sent the ECG to you. And what, what are you going to do? Take him to the cath lab since there's a suspicion for a stentary occlusion. His new ECG changes suggest acute coronary syndrome. Start back on heparin drip because you're suspecting acute coronary syndrome. Or just plan for discharge home with pantoprazole and arrange for outpatient follow-up. Or get an emergent echo to assess new wall motion abnormality. Because this is a question will come in our to our fellow uh, uh, cardiology fellows there to make decision what to do uh, on these patients. Uh, so you can answer those and you can discuss. All right, uh, it's a very interesting distribution, okay? <laughs> That's the thing we, we really like to discuss because uh, I am asking our young physicians to listen to what we discuss. It's very important, very important to recognize this pattern of ECG, okay? First of all, uh, most of them answered A, 65%. Uh, and look at the clinical scenario on this patient, okay? Uh, the patient had chest pain for about three to four minutes. That's it, okay? And it happened when he was eating breakfast, okay, with radiating through the throat area. So before you take him to the cath lab, you really need to go to the patient and, and, and examine the patient, talk to the patient, okay? He did fine overnight, and he actually ambulated in the afternoon. Uh, he had cath uh, stent done in the morning. Ambulated in the afternoon, he walked fine, no problem with that. So, uh, and and when you looked at that, the ECG, uh, you know, in the morning when he was having breakfast, having chest pain, and pain lasted only a few minutes, and it's gone. Okay, and uh, you ask him, you know, how the character of the pain, whether there's any burning sensation with the pain, whether there's any burping, belching with the pain, because with stent reocclusion, normally it's a severe pain. 
and you'd expect significant change on the ECG if it's reocclusion, acute reocclusion uh, on, on the, uh, uh, you know, of the stenting because they, are, they have severe pain. That's not going to stop that within three to four minutes. So clinically, it's very unlikely the patient had reocclusion of the stent, okay, very unlikely. So you don't want to take him to the cath lab, okay? Another thing to understand, recognize the pattern of the ECG, because when you do, yes, we suspect that the patient having acute coronary syndrome, there's a biphasic theory of normality we see, slight positive and slight negative. Now I see in the next morning, deep TO inversion. That's the normal evolution of the EKG after reperfusion, normal evolution. If you do ECG uh, on patients, a lot of time we see without any chest pain, the similar looking ECG you do, uh, you, you look at that, we'll find it in the next morning. So, and, but if you look at the Wellens term, Wellens term, uh, uh, the first ECG when it presented as type A and the next day is type B. But you need to understand that it is a normal phenomena, normal phenomena after you open up the artery, after you reperfuse the artery, uh, the uh, biphasic tube can change to type B Wellen, that is, uh, you know, T wave inversion. So it is normal. And most likely the patient had acid reflux after he ate. It happened while he was eating and after three, four minutes gone. If it is reocclusion, if it's acute coronary syndrome, reocclusion, the pain will not go away that so soon. Not go away that so soon. So clinically, it's very unlikely that, and you'll have more changes on the ECG. Clinically, it's very unlikely that the patient had the stent reoccluded. So you don't have to take him to the cath lab. You just do, if the, what I do, I just let him walk on the hallway, okay? Like we call poor man's stress test, okay? Five times on the hallway, no chest pain. Patient can go home because it's a normal evolution of the ECG uh, and, and give, put him on some pantoprazole for the acid reflux and, and set up for outpatient follow-up. So you see, it's a significant uh, understanding of, uh, of this pattern of ECG to recognize. It is a normal variant of evolution of the ECG after angioplasty. So he doesn't, you don't need to take him to the cath lab. Just send him home with acid reflux medicine, but you know, let him walk, no problem on the hallway. You don't have to do any other testing. You can follow the patient as an outpatient, but definitely he needs to be all cardiac medications that's supposed to be. All right, let's do its third case. If any question, please ask me. I would be happy or our panelists can answer. We have a lot of interventional cardiologists here. Any question or we'll go forward? Because uh, the reason is who answered you know, uh, our audience, please ask questions because that's the way you learn and we would be happy to explain as much knowledge we have, okay? All right, let's go to the next case. 58 year old, a little bit obese, female with a history of hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol problem, came to the emergency room with complaint of recurrent chest pain. And that happens mainly in emotional stress or anxiety situation. It, she doesn't have any short of breath, okay, no dizziness, no passing out spell. When the patient came to the ED, he was pain free. He was pain free when he came to the ED, okay. Lysinopril 10 milligram, atorvastatin metformin, vital signs stable. The ECG showed like that, okay? The reason I'm showing the ECG, they look alike, but they might present a different scenario. But remember the pattern of the ECG, okay? Uh, you know, we call Whelan pattern, Whelan pattern, okay? But, uh, uh, and, uh, here we see the biphasic T wave and slowly more inverted in more V4, V5, V6. But the patient definitely has been having recurrent angina. Okay, in in this situation, uh, when you see biphasic uh, T wave and angina, okay, let's go to the question and see what you think. Okay, let's answer the questions, please. So should we start the patient on aspirin, heparin drip, beta blocker, hydrostatin? and treat conservatively since the patient is pain-free, okay? Or get an echo for assessment of LV function or schedule for pharmacologic stress testing for assessment of ischemia 
or scheduled for CTA for pulmonary embolism or center for heart catheterization? Question and answer. So you can show the answer sheet. Sorry, uh, to answer them, please answer the questions. Okay. Actually, uh, there should be another one E here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, that's okay. All right. So let me answer that. Uh, yeah, any any time you see this type of ECG, okay, a and there's a presentation, uh, or a history of chest pain, recurrent chest pain, but the patient is pain free. Uh, I think it it this patient deserves to go to the cath lab. Okay, that's one of the management strategy. I think most people will agree. Okay. And okay, all right. So a lot of people answered uh, A. All right, the patient. Okay. All right, the patient went to the cat. Uh, no, this is echocardiogram. It reveals a little bit of hyperkinesia in the anterior and septal area, and EF is about fifty-five percent and mild MR. Okay. And uh, I'm going to try to play that uh, cat film. Just very carefully watch that, okay? All right, let me let me play around. So uh, this is the this the, the when when the heart is relaxed, okay? And you know the coronary feels in the diastole, right? Not in the systolic phase, in the diastole. When the heart is relaxed, I see good feeling of the coronaries, okay? And then, and, and and then when when it is when it is in systole, it's almost we don't see much the medial area. Okay. The of the okay. okay. All right. So yeah, you can look at that. There's not much disease there, but what we have, we see that in diastole it's feeling well. Okay, but in the systolic phase, when when I'm when you're putting the systolic phase, almost obliterating the LAD. That is called myocardial bridging, myocardial bridging. They can present similar looking EKG that we mentioned also. Not necessarily exactly, uh, they will present the same way, they might not present with any changes, but since the patient having chest pain, it came after the chest pain and, uh, and came to the ER, patient is pain free. So, so, so that's the, you know, but same we call uh, well in pattern ECG the patient presented, but she was found to have a myocardial bridging, okay? So what myocardial bridging is? Bridging is normally we know that the coronaries runs above the you know, muscle, right? The big arteries then, then go with the perforator, septal perforator or other perforator, they go inside more deeper and to the endothelial, you know, uh, deeper in that area. But the big coronaries are on, on the ep epicardial surface. But when uh, these coronaries, they're born with that, they sometimes could be in different positioning, uh, depending on that, it's, a, it's called partially tunnel, there's half of them. If it's a deep inside, it's a thin myocardial bridge, thick myocardial bridge, very thick, and really very, very thick, okay? The, depending on how deep the course of the epicardial artery goes in the myocardium, that causes the myocardial bridging. Okay, because uh, if it is partially tunnel, like like you know halfway through, they might be asymptomatic. Okay, but but if they are just going a little bit deeper in the myocardium, deeper in the myocardium, they uh, they, they could be potentially symptomatic. And interestingly enough, this patient presented with with a uh, we call Willenert syndrome and turned out to have a, you know a myocardial bridging. Okay. Because if you look at that, that uh, how many people, what's the incidence and prevalence of myocardial bridging, okay? If you look at the autopsy report, and you would be surprised that almost 86% might have some sort of bridging, but most of them are asymptomatic because most of them, they're partially tunnel, okay? But it's they're deep in tunnel, as, as deep they go, they definitely become symptomatic, okay? So you need to be careful when you do the heart cath, you might see, okay, normal arteries, but you have to look at the systolic diastolic phase carefully, understand uh, because the patient is symptomatic, the patient is having symptoms. And particularly you need to be careful on those patients who are young patients 
who are athletic patients and, and they are jogging, running, and those type of patients can, they have different kind of, not only chest pain, they might have you know, different kind of arrhythmia, non-sustained VT, VT, even certain cardiac death is possible. But when you do the, just by the heart catheterization we do, we get around 0.5 to 16% only, okay? But, but the, uh, nowadays, a lot of time we do coronary uh, uh, CT angiogram, and they are similar, uh, they, can, they, uh, they can find more of those myocardial bridging uh, uh, as uh, you know, compare, comparable to autopsy report. Uh, but also another important thing, it really gets more worse when the patient has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because a lot of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, they have chest pain and, and, and they get worse because they already have too much myocardium per 100 gram of tissue. Like, you have, uh, like normally, as for example, you have like from 100 gram of tissue, one vessel going down there, but you have 200 gram tissue, but the vessel is same so you'll have artificial ischemia there because it's not enough to supply the whole 200 gram of myocardial tissue. So they have artificial ischemia there. On, on top of that, if they tunnel through the muscle, definitely they are symptomatic. And this type of patients are more prone to have sudden cardiac death uh, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? So Dr. Hawk. Yes. How did you manage this case? This patient has got the acute coronary syndrome as presentation, but myocardial yes. disease on cat. Yes, I'm, I'm coming to that, okay? So uh, as, as, as the main, another thing that, uh, please look at that, uh, the slide, we, as we talked about that, the coronary perfusion happens in diastole, but, but in systole, it gets squeezed, okay? But the problem is that they are more symptomatic. If, tunnel, if the tunnel is too long and the, under the myocardium, then the coronary perfusion can be impaired, can be impaired even in diastole. It extends to the diastolic phase. And that is, uh, that is proven by intercoronary FFR testing uh, or ultrasound uh, testing. You can see that, that even in the diastolic phase, normally we see the uh, normal opening, but we still, it could be still squeezed because they don't recover uh, in, in the diastolic space. And particularly it gets worse when, when the patient is tachycardic because when you have tachycardia going on to uh, you know, uh, high heart rate, they have decreased time of feeling in diastole, decreased time of feeling. So they get more chest pain, okay? And uh, definitely uh, another, another common phenomenon we see and uh, interventional cardiologists definitely they have noticed that when you have myocardial breathing, as for example, it's going inside the myocardium, this, this is a superficial artery is going inside, but at the very beginning, before the tunneling, before the tunneling at the very beginning, they have different shear strengths, okay? Because the, because the uh, you know, structure is different, they're going inside the myocardium. So uh, in the beginning of the tunneling, uh, uh, because of different shear stress, the uh, different pressure of blood flow in that area, hitting that area, they get more endothelial dysfunction, okay? And they're more prone to have blockage, real blockage, like they're more prone to have atheroma, okay? Uh, uh, so, but that alone is not the cause for their chest pain or symptoms because the tunneling, low blood flow, that is definitely causing it more problem, but the low blood flow inside the myocardium, inside the myocardium during systole and sometimes it extends to the diastole because the tunneling uh, through, the, through the myocardium, they, they are more ischemic, okay? So, uh, and sometimes what happens uh, that we call uh, milking away, because as you see, when you do the heart cath, we see that in systole it disappears and then comes back in diastole. We call milking away effect, that's just gone and then and comes back, gone and comes back, but they don't have real blockage. That's the tunneling. But some people have blockage at the beginning of the tunneling because of the shear stress change in that area. Okay. So, you know, uh, So how we treat, uh, treat these patients, you know, initially we had kind of, we saw that blockages at the beginning, okay? We thought that maybe we'll open up that blockage and they might do better because there are some study, you know, several studies done in, uh, and I think uh, what happened was uh, some people initially started stenting that area, but, uh, but normally the data we are getting right now, they don't have good outcome on that, okay? Because on those data we see 
that they have more you know ischemic events they have more like target vessel revascularization they have to go it again to open it up again uh, and they had more problem with uh, uh, like stent fracture because you know it's in the myocardium very rigid and it's when when, when it, a stent is a very rigid structure when the heart squeezes they can fracture the stent okay and reocclusion that's that's common so uh, that practice has gone away so now there's no recommendation right now to put the stent in myocardial bridging despite that the initial part could be some you know true atheroma building up there Uh, so, and, and the data we have, as we see here, you know, target vessel uh, re revascularization 42 in, in this 10 group, they had more problem, okay? They had more MI, more death, okay? So it's not recommended nowadays putting stent, okay? So, uh, and as we see that standing called, you know, questionable efficacy on the angina really, but they're not lasting. They have perforation about 6.3% in strain restenosis, late strain thrombosis, and high risk of strain fracture. So it, it just came out of favor, that technique. But the main treatment right now, just let's go for it backwards. Definitely uh, risk factor modification, relief potential triggers, if it's possible, antiplatelet therapy, if atlas is present, but main treatment, really beta blocker, okay? Or if they cannot tolerate beta blocker, then calcium channel blocker. So what beta blocker does, first of all, they decrease the heart rate, they decrease oxygen consumption, okay? And, and, and they decrease the contractility of the heart rate, okay? That gives you more time to fill in in diastole. That's the main effect uh, because those two patients, they do better if they're, you know, uh, some symptomatic, they're walking, jogging, having chest pain, and you should give a trial of beta blocker. And, and a lot of time we see they do better with the beta blocker therapy. If the blood pressure is on the low side, you know, you can try bread in those patients. But one important thing, this type of patient should not get vasodilator. Nitroglycerin is contraindicated in these patients. That's very important. Do not give long-acting nitrate in this patient for chest pain. What's going to happen, like the, uh, the patient has tunneling, like there's tunneling inside, okay? And if you give nitroglycerin uh, just above the tunnel, the vessels get bigger, there's redistribution of blood flow uh, from that tunnel uh, away from the blood flow. So they, they get still syndrome because they already compromised in, in the, in the, inside the myocardial cords. They have a still syndrome, so it, it makes it worse. Sometimes it can cause angina more. Okay, you give nitro, patient having more angina, you need to think about the patient has you know, a myocardial bridging going on, okay? So medical treatment is the first approach, okay? And, and definitely uh, if the patient is uh, very symptomatic and your medical treatment fails, then the treatment is surgical, okay? The main, uh, if the patient is partially underneath, not very deep and not very long, then we call uh, unroofing, uh, you know, my, basically you put incision on the muscle and take the artery out, okay? We call unroofing of the coronary artery. It is the ideal treatment, okay? But if the patient is like more than 25 millimeter long bridge inside the myocardium and half a centimeter deep, half a centimeter deep, then, then the roofing would be difficult to cut so much myocardium. Then you have to just bypass surgery, okay? Uh, sometimes if it's most commonly happens, you know, in the LED territory, you can do robotic surgery with Lima to LED. You can, it, uh, without opening the chest, you can do that, or mid cap surgery, you can do that with minimally in invasive surgery. But you need to be careful also, because you need to really understand the depth and, and, and length of that. And you have to really initially define uh, either intercoronary, you can do FFR testing or some sort of functional testing inside to make sure they are truly symptomatic with that. Because if they're not that functionally active, uh, you know, obstruction of blood flow, if you do bypass, then what's going to happen, the blood will still flow through the, through the uh, myocardial bridge tunneling and the graft will be atriotic and close off. So you need to have functional testing before making the decision where the patient needs to go for bypass on that. But, uh, but interestingly enough, this patient presented the similar looking EKG that we saw in the Wellen syndrome. 
All right, let's do another case. 70 year old female presented to emergency room with chest pain about 30 minutes duration. It began 20 minutes after she received the news that her husband in critical condition in the intensive care unit and may need some surgery. Basically it's huge stress for her, okay? And age about 70. Pain was described five over 10 non-radiating substernal and associated lightheadedness. Vital signs stable, nothing much, despite that she's nervous and breathing a little bit faster, but otherwise okay, but no hypoxia, okay? And there's some slight murmur, you know, uh, apical systolic murmur at the apex. And this is the ECG, okay? Look at the similar looking ECG, but the presentation is different, everybody. Okay, here I'm just going to go ahead and read that. Definitely sinus rhythm, but the main concern that we have V2, V3, V4, V5, symmetric, all along, like really deep to your inversion all along, okay? Um, it's, it's a little bit, you know, looking like type B wallen, but a little bit more pronounced. Uh, but you have to look at the clinical scenario also, okay? So now let's look at that. Let's read the questions and see whether you can answer that. What do we need to do in this case? Okay, let's start her on aspirin. Heparin drip, beta blocker, high dose statin, and treat conservatively. Okay. Get an echocardiogram to assess LV function. Schedule for pharmacologic stress testing for assessment of ischemia. Next morning, if enzymes doesn't rise that much. Okay. And you can do a CTA for pulmonary embolism or center for heart catheterization. All right, uh, please answer this question because look at the clinical scenario presenting ECG. That's also very important. You can put the questions for uh, uh, you know answer sheet there for them. Full, please. All right, we'll see the questions. Uh, sorry, answer, let's see. What is the poll, Rivu, Kamrul? All right, let's see if not. Okay, maybe there is some difficulty putting mm. that. Okay, let's let's see. You know, this case you can argue, you know, what to do. Okay, look at the scenario of the patients, okay? okay? Can you call any participant? Yes, uh, 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 all right, yes. Uh, any, any participant would comment on this case and what to do? Uh, Bishal Sresto from Nepal, Dr. Bishal Sresto. Can you hear us, Dr. Bishal Sresto from Nepal? Bishal Sresto. Or Kani is Anunna from Nepal.
एनीवन कैन आंसर विशाल श्रेष्ठ हूं or anyone anyone from uh, whoever willing to please <laughs> now this is a case scenario that you are going to see in your in your in your you know practice so uh, go ahead and discuss that anyone volunteers all right i think we'll we'll start discussion hey, yeah uh, technical problem i think uh, yes right. should we go forward after we all right i'll go forward okay so let's see you know the presentation of this case uh, let's look at that elderly lady okay and ha uh, start having chest pain significant chest pain after hearing a bad news like it's a significant stress to her uh, that husband in the emergency room uh, sorry in the uh, icu and need some emergency surgery or something like that and having chest pain she did fine before no no problem with that okay uh, at her age and the ecg pattern is that we call a more like more pronounced well and b type syndrome like deep to inversion okay that type of deep to inversion you see that a few cases you can look at it right uh, one uh, one common uh, thing that you know for well, this uh, any, anything going on with stress cardiomyopathy or something like that another thing also uh, concern about or the patient having stroke okay uh we neurologic like two inversion that you call it but the patient doesn't have those type of symptoms in the in the you know uh, physical exam so um or the patient is having true acute coronary syndrome okay so yeah, but this case you can argue whether you need to take her to the cath lab right now or you can do in between certain things to uh you know confirm your thought process because uh, as in medicine we always try to analyze uh, ourselves you know uh, and also each clinical scenario is different it's not like algorithm that you have to do everything that you need to do uh, with, with the tu inversion okay uh, but in this case you have high suspicions that you know elderly patients with a patient has something going on with the stress i think the answer b would be the right option they get a quick echocardiogram bedside echo and you can uh, if you see certain pattern then your diagnosis could be very obvious down there and let's look at that what the patient had okay so i'm going to try to play that okay uh look at that okay we see that mid to base is contracting very well okay in this view and you see that apical you know hyperkinesis down there okay and and the similar okay you see that mid to base is very contracting well but the whole apex and and from mid to apex uh, and it's a multi regional it's not one single vessel distribution okay so in free wall you know mid to mid to apex and free wall mid to apex apex all are down okay here you can see better okay this pattern you need to keep in mind when you see the echocardiogram this is pure takasubo pattern okay pure takasubo pattern and that kind of fits the story with the patient patient elderly patient and happen with stress okay serious stress okay and um, presentation of takasubo can happen for many reason okay i had a patient we had hip surgery like for the last 4 5 years i had at least 6 or 7 cases uh, of takasubo after hip surgery patient actually had uh, cardiac arrest okay <laughs> and and apparently had arrhythmia and had cardiac arrest in vt and it looks like that uh, you know we did a echocardiogram and exactly the similar pattern okay so it could be stress it could be just any kind of uh, you know pain severe pain can do that uh, different kind of triggering factors should be uh, associated with that okay and and now uh, and there's a question about with the apex there with is any clot or anything we did a contrast study on that and looks like all right and you can see very good 
we're looking at the meat to base segments vigorously contracting, okay? This is a classic for Takasubo, okay? And we don't see any clot in the apical area because sometimes they can form clot because the akinetic epi apical area that, uh, you know, for the time being. Uh, and it's extremely important to re recognize these patients and treat those patients as, as quickly as possible with, you know, with uh, definitely their LA function is down. The beta block is the treatment choice and also ACE inhibitor or ARB, you need to initiate that. But good thing is that they recover very quickly, okay? And by, <clears throat> Uh, you know, Mio criteria uh, that this type of patient, uh, and, and if you do the heart catheterization, you can see that mid to base contracting very well and in apical ballooning in systole. Okay. All right. Uh, these type of patients will require, will, will require uh, heart catheterization. Okay. Uh, but uh, in this particular patient that we had, uh, we, we decided not to do that. The reason being, uh, <clears throat> the patient had stage four lymphoma, has been on chemo, and her troponin was minimally elevated. Okay, so we decided, uh, you know, we wanted to do heart cat, but after looking at all her factors and all these things, we decided not to do it, and we treated her conservatively. But 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 by guidelines, by criteria, you should do that to confirm that no LED disease. Okay. Uh, but we, in this particular scenario, we didn't do it because of the, you have to manage, balance each patient, the clinical situation, longevity of life, quality of life. And actually, we repeated the echo in about two months later, our LA function normalized totally, 55 to 60%. And, and this wall motion abnormality is gone. Okay. So though I, I presented these cases. I want to make sure that our audience and the trainees that you're here to look at that, recognize those patterns. Because this biphasic TUS, always you have to be on high alert, okay? But they can present in different scenario though, okay? Because it could be normal evolution of reperfusion pattern of the ECG that you, you, any patient get a heart attack, go open up, and, and you can see the TUS inversion like type 2 Wellen, uh, we call Wellenoid uh, EKG, uh, that's normal variant. Another one, really, they can present in, in the either type 1, type 2, you need to be alerted with that because they had very tight lesions sitting there. They are very close to get heart attack and acute ST elevation MI and cause problem. And let's see, I have some ECG because I had very interesting uh, one patient, okay? Like look at the ECG. Uh, this patient basically uh, is another pattern like we call inferior wellness, okay? Presented with some two inversion in, in the inferior leads, okay? And then next ECG, it's kind of normalized, okay? Patient is still in the ED, okay? And then about 10, 15 minutes later, uh, he having chest pain again, and we see slight elevation of ST. Even continue to have chest pain, five minutes later, look at the ECG. Huge ST elevation in front of it. So violent, uh, violent type ECG, you cannot ignore that. That's the bottom line of discussion today. Make sure keep in mind any dynamic TUF changes, they are waiting some something to happen. Okay. So if you wait there and go home and the, in the middle of the night you put him on morphine, the patient might not feel pain. The patient having acute heart attack and he is going to lose muscle and potential death. Okay. I'll conclude that way, other way. Uh, I think it's already more than an hour. Okay. Anybody want to discuss or any comments and uh, or any questions would be happy to answer from the audience. So thank you very much for your excellent presentation, Dr. Hogg. There is a question from uh, Dr. Bishal Sresto from Nepal. Mm -hmm. Actually, he asked the question during your second presentation. He wanted to know that the, 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 your uh, case one, case two, and case three are almost similar issues. He wanted to know if the patient does not have any symptom but presented with this kind of the ECG, what should be the management strategy? Yes, uh, Wallen, Wallen syndrome or dynamic TUF inversion, it has to come with two things. History is most important, okay? If the patient had never had any chest pain, either resting or, or uh, either resting or, or you know, exercise or something, then it's a different scenario. Okay, if the, but the Wallen syndrome, when you, we need to be alerted that patient had 
symptoms at home, he might not be having symptoms now, like pretty recent symptoms, pretty recent symptoms. Patient will tell you the patient having chest pain on exhaustion, chest pain on stress, anxiety. You cannot ignore that. You have to take it very seriously and, and go more invasive approach to rule out. If the patient never had symptoms, and look at previous ECG, ECG with the patient had a year ago or something, if the similar looking ECG, you don't have to do much. Okay, but normally, normally they have some some symptoms. Uh, it's not like normal looking ECG biphasic T wave. Uh, it's not normal, normal. Okay, but Dr. that's the Bishal. way. If the recognition of the pattern. Okay, yes. Doctor Bishal, can you hear us? You can comment, Doctor Bishal Sister. You are not audible, Bishal Sister. Unmute, please. Mm -hmm. Jamil. Yes. Comment, please. Uh, Dr. Bishal says to, if anytime you are audible, you can comment. Dr. Jamil. Uh, today's discussion was excellent. And what we often ignore uh, regarding this uh, type of inversion. So what uh, Aziz Bhai has explained that along with the symptom with this type of dynamic T inversion is very important. One must not ignore and take it very seriously. Otherwise, uh, one might get heart attack. So I again thank Aziz Bhai for uh, showing us the nice cases. Thank you. Wadu Chaudhuri. Please, Abdullah Adhu Chaudhuri. Rubik sir is possible not here. Sir? Not one I may, but anyway. Hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So any comment from the uh, faculties or from the participant, Dr. Bishal Srishtu, Kani Zanun or anyone, Naim Hassan? So really it was a beautiful presentation. The beauty of the today's presentation that the similar type of ECG but different type of presentation, focused ECG, really excellent, excellent presentation, really. I think uh, today at least I am successful. That is, I have learned a lot from this kind of ECG. We see it many times, we ignore it, we, uh, but it actually does not put uh, such a type of importance to this kind of ECG, how important these are. So excellent, beautiful presentation, Dr. Razul Haq. So we can oh. finish. Uh, Professor Abdullah Adu Chaudhary. As a possibility, he is not here. He is not here again. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I am going to call Kuraj again. Rubik, sir. Rufik sir, thakben na bolsa na kya? Na it's okay. Thank you. I think uh, let's see there. Sir. So we can conclude today's session. Uh -huh. Thank you, Dr. Azulog. Thank you. Many many thanks for your today's presentation. Nice, excellent. We enjoyed it a lot. Now welcome. Thank you very much. I hope uh, you know people, our students and uh, fellows, they keep focus on this type of pattern, and always always uh, you know coincide with the, what the clinical symptoms are. Okay. You cannot ignore this because different scenario can present similar looking KG. Okay. We will wait for your next series of cases. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Okay. Ribu. Is there anyone sir. from the... Hello? Sir, tell me, sir. Is there any question you have to ask? Do you have to ask any questions? Do you have to ask any questions? Do you have to ask any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
कमरुल सरि मैं बार बार पोल डाका हम रिभु रिभू मैं रेसपन्स नाई प्लस पोल दी लास्ट बार तुम्हारा पोल दाओ नहीं रिभु नाई आज के ना खराब छा बार बार पोल दी कथा জামিল থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ ভেরি মাচ ভাই ইউ ওয়েলকাম থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ আদা ভাই সরি স্যার আসসালামু আলাইকুম স্যার বলবো গুড নাইট গুড নাইট সাউন্ড